Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Council of the Town of Oakville. It's September 20th at 7.30 p.m. and everybody uh, is welcome. I would like to ask everybody to join Council in the singing of O Canada. Please rise. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. Everyone's in very good voice tonight. Um, you know, in 1820, indigenous people here began welcoming settlers from all over the British Empire. Soon, they were helping slaves escaping from the United States to settle here, too. Today, our indigenous founding partners are still here enjoying this land with us. They fish and camp under their treaty rights. Indigenous people in their thousands also live with us as neighbors and friends. Our indigenous white and black settlers created a community with an attractive degree of harmony and prosperity. In 1857, Ontario gave official recognition of Oakville as a town. At Town Hall, all these years later, we fly the flag of the Mississaugas of the Credit beside the flags of Oakville, Ontario, and Canada. We fly these flags together to acknowledge our origins. People from all over the world are attracted to the livability we have created. We offer newcomers a warm spirit of welcome. We offer everyone our founding story so everyone knows what we are part of. We feel sorrow and distress for acts of racism and intolerance that are suffered across Canada and here at home. We want our future to be equitable and inclusive for all. The path of truth and reconciliation can unite us all. Please keep well, stay safe, and let us on council know of any chance to be helpful to you and yours. Please let us know anytime you can help increase Oakville's harmony, prosperity, and livability. Madam Clerk, are there any uh, Register, uh, are there any regrets for this meeting? There are no regrets for tonight's meeting. Thank you. Um, then, Council, I would invite your attention to uh, the opportunity to declare pecuniary interest. Councilor Longo. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm putting forward a declaration of conflict of interest for item 9.1 which is the Community Energy Strategy Implementation Update, as I'm a current member of the Board of Directors of Future Energy Oakville, and I've registered my declaration of conflict of interest with the clerk's office. Thank you uh, for following all the correct procedures. Uh, Council, you have before you five sets of minutes in the agenda. Are there any corrections or changes that you wish made? In the absence of changes, is there a mover and seconder to confirm the minutes? Councillor Giddings and Councillor Elgar, thank you. Um, is there any objection? There being none, uh, Madam Clerk, that carries and the minutes are confirmed. Um, we have no public presentations this evening and um, it would be appropriate to resolve into Committee of the Whole. And if you wish to do that, we need mover and seconder. Councillor Hazlitt Thiel, thank you. Councillor Longo, thank you. Any objection? There being none, that's carried. Thank you, everybody. So now, Council, we have um, uh, 10 consent items. Are there any separations of the consent items? Councillor O'Meara. 
Thank you, Your Worship. You can separate out um, item 7.4. Yes, sir. Thank you. 7.4. Councillor, um, would you give me a motion for the rest of the consent items? Happy to. Thank you. Is there any objection to the rest of the consent items? There being none, they're carried. Councillor O'Meara, you have the floor for 7.4. Thank you, Your Worship. It's, um, you know, obviously all of us are attuned to what's been happening in our neighbour uh, municipality, Burlington, with the recent uh, uh, interactions between coyotes and, and residents here. Um, I, I just have a question with regards to the agreement that, that we've signed here and what exactly the Humane Society's role is with regards to um, to wildlife. And I, and I would ask maybe staff to comment in particular on uh, 8.2, the, the, the section that says the society will not respond to wildlife nuisance calls, but will refer inquiries to private wildlife control businesses. Um, I don't think that's the expectation of our residents. And I, 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 I'm wondering if staff can maybe elaborate on what exactly uh, the Humane Society's role is if coyotes are near and people look to have animal professionals respond to that. Um, what, 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 what we're entering into here and what the expectation is of the Humane Society. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to Councillor O'Meara. Uh, um, I think I can assist with that. The, the um, Humane Society's response to wild animals in this contract is the same as it's been um, in past contracts. Um, what, what we have separated out in the contract, um, I believe uh, we do separate out coyotes specifically in the contract and they do assist our staff with that. Um, sorry, I'm just try, trying to get the um, exact section. Uh, the, so section eight identifies the, the society will support coyote concerns in the community through joint education sessions, public meetings, and one-on-one -on -one conversation on an as-needed or issue-specific basis. Um, and, and so this, this allows them to work within our coyote protocol with our, with our staff. Um, the separation is any other wildlife um, is extraneous to that and does not fall within the contract, which is consistent with uh, past uh, animal control contracts. And again, I would note that uh, generally when we're talking animal control contracts, we're talking domestic animals. So that's the separation uh, between wildlife and, uh, and uh, domestic animals. I, I appreciate that, um, Director Barry, but it's, it's very convoluted because the wildlife section eight specifically talks about coyote concerns, but you're telling me 8.2 doesn't rely, doesn't relate to coyote concerns. It relies to other wildlife. So I'm, I'm a little lost in exactly what our bylaw is saying here. Either, either 8.0 is is related to coyotes or it's not. Can you can you just clarify exactly what 8.0 says? Is it with regards to coyotes or is it with is 8.2 not about coyotes? I'm I'm confused. Yeah, it is, it is some confusing wording. Um, I will give you that for sure. Uh, but the it actually covers both uh, together. So when it comes to coyotes, the Humane Society does assist the town, and uh, and. Uh, assist us with our coyote pro protocol. They've been uh, instrumental in helping us. They continue to be instrumental in helping us with our coyote protocol, and that will continue under this contract. When it comes to other animals, and I believe it's highlighted in the report as well, if you look at something like a skunk or a raccoon in a yard that's not in distress, but it's just in a yard, then the Humane Society wouldn't be responding to that, and that'd be the responsibility of the homeowner to have removed. Yeah, I, I understood that, and I think that's very clear, and I don't think any resident would have any objections to, to, to those sort of differentiations. I just don't think the differentiation is very clear in the wording that I'm reading here, and I think there's an expectation um, that that the Humane Society will do more than just educate and meet one-on-one -on -one with people if a coyote's coming down the street and, and people feel threatened. So I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that that's clear in our expectation of the Humane Society, and and I guess my concern is with all that we've been going through over the past, and I'll be quite honest, two years, it's not just the past few months with Burlington, I would hope there's an added level in the contract that we're signing right now of responsibility or, or requirement of the Humane Society to up, up their game a little bit um, because we need the help, we need the resources. So um, has that been factored into this, this new contract that we're signing for another three years? Is there 
Are we asking for more help? Because it seems like residents are expecting more help in dealing with coyotes right now. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, I, I think I would have to answer that by saying we do have a, we have a Folsom pro program in Oakville. Uh, having the assistance of the Humane Society has never been an issue. Um, and, and we do follow our coyote protocol. And, and I do have to identify that it's not just the Humane Society that's part of our coyote protocol. It's also our bylaw enforcement officers, our mobile compliance officers. As a group, we enforce it. And I think um, on tonight's agenda, there's, uh, um, we do highlight some of the things that we've, that we've accomplished already in uh, 2022 that have included 32 investigations that have been conducted, over 250 hours of enforcement officer time looking at uh, coyote issues. We've uh, distributed over 1,200 flyers. Uh, when we see coyote issues. So we have a very proactive program. And, and as I said, the Humane Society is a, a key part of that. And this, this contract allows them to continue to be a key part of that and resources won't be an issue. Uh, I can assure you of that as we go forward. Well, oh, that's great, um, Director Barry. And that, that gives me the confidence. As long as, as you're, you, you think we have the resources in this contract to deal with what seems to be an escalating issue, then I'm, I'm confident that uh, that is good. I just wanted to raise that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Meara. Mr. Barry, for the benefit of the public, um, could you please outline the multi-part, multi-level town response to coyotes so that it's clearer that um, the, Humane, the Humane Society is only one piece and that there are many other uh, players, including the police, the province, as well as municipal enforcement? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, I think uh, the key part to our protocol is that we, we have a, a long-standing protocol in place, and it's really based on the interactions that, uh, that occur in the community. So if we look at one of the key pieces of our protocol or one of the key, pe one of the key tools we use, it's our um, online reporting tool for coyote incidents. Um, when that's monitored all the time by municipal enforcement with the assistance of uh, the Humane Society, and as issues come in, we react to them, everything from a sighting to an interaction. Uh, depending on the, uh, the, um, the nature of the interaction, uh, you'll see officers go out to look for uh, habituation through um, uh, people feeding coyotes. Um, if we have multiple um, concerns in a neighborhood, that's where you'll see flyers going out. And if we were to come into a situation where we, uh, where we actually had a, a concern, a, a threatening coyote, um, we would contact the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, who also would, as you've heard in the city of Burlington, are, are part of that process. And I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't note that uh, through all of this, if there's ever an emergency, Halton Regional Police uh, are right there. And if a call is made to them, they will come out as well um, to deal with that emergency. So our program is, is really based on, on the issues that come up and dealing with them um, as they come up. And, and I would note that unlike other municipalities, we also have a 24-7 enforcement service. So um, as issues come up, we're available to deal with them. Thank you very much, Mr. Barry. Councillor Adams, you're next. Thanks very much. I wondered if you could clarify for us the, uh, the cost escalation in the contract, uh, particularly the salaries and benefits element. Is that largely related to additional staffing or is this an escalation in the, uh, the actual per person salary benefit costs? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, in response to that, uh, it, it is really in relation to the escalation of salaries per person. Uh, it's not an, an increased number of staff, although there is a slight increased number. Um, but over the years, the, uh, the issue the Humane Society has had is, is um, retention of staff. Um, the the um, a salary level of the Humane Society was not uh, equivalent to surrounding areas. So this is an attempt to um, raise that salary level to become more equivalent and be able to retain staff um, for longer periods of time. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Thank you, Worship. I want to take this opportunity to um, um, ask a question with respect to the facility. Now, I understand that the Humane Society is a separate charity and they're a separate organization. I've served on the board in the past, so I'm intimately familiar with how they operate. But for the number of years I've been here, they've been... Um, uh, I guess, under served by their facility. And I'm curious what the future holds for that particular site 
and there may not be a response or an answer tonight, but I'm wondering if not, is it possible to get a report uh, from the Humane Society? Perhaps they could come and talk to us a little bit about the future of that facility. Um, and I say this because obviously in accordance with this contract, they are not just providing a service, but they are our official pound keeper. So it's, we have some, some responsibility here as well as to make sure those facilities are adequate. Uh, recently toured the Humane Society facility and I can attest to the fact that they are literally bursting at the seams uh, with pandemic pets and uh, um, I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. So my question again is, is there any information on the future of the facility? Uh, if it's not available this evening, could we ask for perhaps the Humane Society to uh, come and delegate and provide us with an update on what their plans are? Councillor, I will arrange that for Council. Thank you for the question. Well, I too have toured it. And I can corroborate that they're somewhat pressed by discarded pandemic pets. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, sad. Thank you, Worship. I need a mover for the, uh, uh, the item 7.4. Councillor Knoll, thank you. Is there an objection to 7.4? Madam Clerk, there's no objection, so that too is adopted. And that brings us to are four discussion items, and the very first one is the Community Energy Strategy Implementation Update. And we have a staff presentation from Rija Rasool, our Senior Climate Officer, and Suraj Mann, our Manager of Corporate Strategy. And uh, we also have registered delegations who we're looking forward to hearing from, and we've also received written delegations from others unable to be here tonight, all of which we welcome and appreciate. Um, if everyone will give their attention now to Ms. Razul, uh, we can be uh, briefed and reminded, and, and for some members of the public, perhaps learn what this item is about. Ms. Razul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and members of the public. My name is Rija Rasool, and today I'll be providing an update on the implementation of the Community Energy Strategy. Um, mostly focused on the town's perspective as one member organization of the Oakville Energy Task Force. For some context, in February 2020, Council unanimously endorsed the community energy strategy brought forward by the Oakville Energy Task Force and committed to providing financial and in-kind support for the task force to develop and establish what is now known as Future Energy Oakville, or FEO, over a five-year period. In January of 2021, FEO was incorporated, and in June of 2021, a service agreement between the FEO and the town was put in place for a period of 14 months to formalize the expectations of and support for FEO by the town. Today, I'll be highlighting progress made since 2021 to implement the Community Energy Strategy, or CES, and we'll be seeking an extension to the town's service agreement with FEO. The Community Energy Strategy established a common community vision for collaboration to achieve a sustainable energy future in Oakville. It also set 2041 community-wide goals to improve energy efficiency reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and enhance the local economy. The Oakville Energy Task Force is a cross-sectoral group of local energy and community leaders that leverages community relationships and perspectives to advise on and advocate for the successful implementation of the CES. The CES, along with the continued collaboration between the town, Sheridan College, the task force, and others, represents a significant part of the community's response to Oakville's climate emergency declaration um, declared unanimously by council in June 2019. The implementation framework for the strategy recognizes that an energy transformation really requires and depends on community-wide contributions and that solutions must be coordinated across multiple stakeholders from the beginning. The CES supports building community capacity to do that and carves out a role for the town so that we can focus on the areas where we can have the most authority and capacity to make the most impact. It does this in two ways. The first is through an innovative community governance model 
um, seen through the establishment of Future Energy Oakville, which is a community-based independent nonprofit organization uh, that leverages community perspectives, knowledge, networks, and resources. The second way is through a set of 12 priority projects to be implemented by multiple stakeholders by 2025 that all have strategic objectives, delivery partners, and milestones, although those milestones do not reflect the impacts of COVID-19, which was declared a pandemic just a few weeks after the strategy was first endorsed. In reference to the priority projects, the CES defines where the town can best play a role. And these roles include, firstly, as a convener and facilitator, where the town is uniquely positioned to convene and facilitate stakeholders to develop plans and strategies. The second is as a policymaker, where the town can ensure that policies, procedures, and bylaws are aligned with this vision and goals of the community energy strategy. And thirdly, leading by example, where the town can, can and, and should demonstrate corporate leadership in the community. These first three are bolded on the slide because they have a direct link to the how and why the municipality is playing a part in delivering these projects. The last two, as an economic development supporter and promoting energy literacy and climate action, are really foundational to all of the projects. In the next few slides, I'll highlight some town-led initiatives that support priority project implementation happening in parallel to the development of FEO. The town has continued work on some initiatives as FEO ramps up, and it is important to note that these initiatives are the ones that are being led by, town, by the town only and um, by multiple departments in the town. Along with the town's investment, they're also attracting large investments by external stakeholders. In the town's role as a convener and facilitator, the first initiative I'll talk about is the business case to establish a company to deliver a comprehensive home energy retrofit program. In August 2020, council endorsed a memorandum of understanding with Oakville Enterprises Corporation, or OEC, in support of a funding application to drive the development of a business case to deliver deep energy retrofits for Oakville homes. The study was completed earlier this year and it finds that a business case does exist to support further development of a program that encourages deep energy retrofits in Oakville. It is important to note that the business case study is one initial input into what ultimately is a much larger process a part of the next phase of business planning will be to complete further due diligence, including additional market testing and program risk assessment and drafting program design and administration processes to ensure that the best possible program, both for Oakville homeowners and one that best supports the goals of the CES is presented to council for approval. The retrofit program is also one component of what's needed to progress towards the CES goal to reduce emissions by 50% by 2041. While a retrofit program on its own will not deliver all of the savings we need to achieve that target, it is a key component of the strategy for homes and buildings specifically. And I also want to note that providing financing for retrofits um, also on its own is, is only one component of a successful retrofit program and it's not sufficient to drive demand or uptake in a program on its own. It's important for us to implement other enabling strategies to support the market, including financial incentives like rebates, as well as non-financial activities like effective marketing and outreach and engaging and training um, contractors. At this stage, we've also not limited or excluded any specific technologies or retrofit options. What the program could look like will evolve throughout the next phase of development. We're also working on other enabling strategies alongside this to help advance these goals, such as a capacity building and training initiative for local contractors on heat pump technology in collaboration with other local area municipalities, again, to support these goals. Next steps of this initiative include confirming funding for the next stage through a capital request for 2023 as well as applying for additional FCM grant funding and working to establish a third party company to deliver a potential program. 
This third party company must be set up sustainably and with the right governance structures in place so that it can be self-sufficient and succeed in the long term. The potential program will also integrate community feedback and uh, target comprehensive deep energy retrofits that are needed to help achieve the targets of the CES. The next initiative is the district energy feasibility studies. In January 2021, Council endorsed a collaboration with the Consulate of Denmark in Toronto to complete these studies, which were designed to draw community stakeholders to the table in support of CES priority projects. A pre-feasibility study, which evaluated opportunities for district energy in two study areas in Oakville, the hospital district, as well as downtown and Kerr, was completed earlier this year. In collaboration with OEC, work is underway to pursue a more detailed feasibility study and analysis, as well as pathway to implementation for one of the sites, the hospital district, with a recently submitted grant funding application to FCM to support this work. The same district energy studies I just mentioned will also help the town flesh out what we need to do to enable district energy um, as a or to enable scaled district energy in our role as a policymaker. Additionally, as a part of the planning process, we're working with the planning team to ensure that the goals and targets of the community energy strategy are integrated into the planning process. For example, through working groups at the official plan review process, as well as in transportation plans and strategies, such as the transportation master plan update and parking management strategy. In the town's role as leading by example, I'll start with the corporate energy initiatives that are led by facilities and construction management. Emissions reductions of corporate facilities is ahead of schedule to meeting the 2024 target established in the 2020 Corporate Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan. This has been a result of energy conservation projects and retrofits, as well as an overall increase in staff engagement on energy management initiatives. And starting in 2022, the town is also working on developing deep energy retrofit studies, which will help understand the resources and requirements needed for individual facilities to reach net zero carbon and low energy use standards. The next two projects are related to low carbon mobility, uh, starting with the, a collaboration with the province of Ontario and federal government to begin the transition and expansion of Oakville's local transit fleet with fully battery electric buses. Over the next five years, approximately 50% of Oakville Transit's fleet will be converted from diesel to battery electric power. And secondly, expanding electric vehicle or EV charging infrastructure across Oakville with the recent installation of 16 new dual wand level two EV charging stations uh, in spring 2022 bringing the total number of stations throughout the town to 23 for a total of 46 spaces that are offering EV charging. Last month, staff also submitted a second funding application to NRCAN to support the installation of, a, of an additional 24 charging stations, primarily for town fleet vehicles. As a member of the task force, the town committed to the startup of Future Energy Oakville, FIO's delegation will summarize their progress towards items in the service agreement. And as a part of Council's commitment to support FIO over a five-year period, to date, $250,000 has been approved and provided to, to them. Since FIO was in its first year of operation at the time the service agreement was put in place, it was valid for a short period of 14 months. And given challenges faced due to the COVID pandemic and considering the recent hiring of an executive director, we are seeking to extend the service agreement with FEO uh, for, sorry, through to March 2023 to help aid the transition of the new executive director. The relationship between the town and Future Energy Oakville will continue to evolve as they progress and establish themselves, and this may be subject to future service agreements accordingly. I'll end my presentation here with the recommendations of the report. While this presentation and report highlighted some of our community energy initiatives, these do represent just one part of the town's larger climate action portfolio and how the town is addressing the climate emergency. 
Earlier this year, our team brought forward the Climate Action Progress and Directions Report to Council in April, which provided a broader overview of the town's climate efforts to date in response to the 2019 Climate Emergency Declaration. Thank you, and I'm happy to receive any comments or questions. Thank you very much. Council, do you have questions for Ms. Razul? Councillor Knoll. Thank you. I couldn't find my electronic hand. <laughs> um, uh, great report. Thank you very much. I have one minor question, and that is with respect to EV charging infrastructure. Um, uh, I, the, the mayor spoke about the incredible partnership that, uh, that we've established with Ford and their great advancements on their uh, EV production here in Oakville. And I note that um, level two chargers are generally not really, uh, uh, frankly, not that useful for the, the newer cars, for Teslas, for, for uh, the new Fords, the new Mustang, et cetera. Are we looking at any kind of expansion to something beyond level two, for example, level three, DC fast charging, et cetera? And part two to that question was uh, recently at AMO, uh, two of the um, third party EV charging companies namely Flow and Ivy. Ivy, which I think is a, a part of Ontario Hydro, if I'm not mistaken, they were talking about partnerships with municipalities. Have we explored those opportunities to go beyond where we are right now with our current EV planning? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, regarding exploring Level 3 charging technology, um, at the time the, the first funding uh, application was submitted to the ZVIP program, I believe uh, the requirement was for level two stations, and that's primarily why that was pursued. Um, at this time, we haven't explored level three charging or kind of developed a plan to pursue that. Um, it is largely dependent on the funding criteria funding applications, and I know that um, staff are looking into developing a, an EV strategy for the town, and it'll definitely be looked at as a part of that broader strategy. I also know that Halton Region is in process of or initiating a region-wide EV strategy, um, and, and our team coordinates with them regularly, so it can definitely be addressed through, through that strategy as well. I should have known you would have been ahead of me, um, so thank you for that. Could I ask that when you are uh, looking further into this, maybe collaborate with uh, our friends over at Oakville Hydro and uh, to, to maybe look at the opportunities to partner with those third-party providers. Like I mentioned, Ivy, which is a, um, I believe it's a government, uh, I believe that they are a uh, division of, Oak, of Ontario Hydro, and so there would be, there's natural synergies potentially there. So I, I would just ask that perhaps make a note of that, and if that could be something you look at for a future report, I'd be really appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noel. Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, you talked about the retro, uh, retrofit program and that there would be more needed to drive the market, such as marketing. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Would we be using, have opportunities to use things other than the town communications or councillor communications by partnering with the Chamber of Commerce or Oakville Green or HEN or any one of uh, a number of groups that share the same concerns? I'm just wondering how robust this would be. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, there are certainly opportunities beyond the town's communications channels. Um, one initiative that I mentioned we're looking into is um, training sessions for local contractors. Contractors are, are a key stakeholder to any retrofit program since they are the ones completing the retrofits. Um, so engaging them appropriately is a, is a big contributor to the success of a program. Um, and like you mentioned, the Chamber of Commerce, other contractors associations, as well as local municipalities who are also in various stages of exploring or developing their own programs are all resources that we can use um, to take lessons learned on communications approaches that have worked um, beyond just the traditional kind of town communication channels. Thank you. And I don't know who wants this next one, but uh, this council has been has many times put through uh, motions for the province uh, our desire to increase the efficiencies contained in the Ontario Building Code. Uh, when is that 
coming up for its next update. Anyone have an idea on that? <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, I'm not sure of um, an exact timeline on that next proposed update, um, but we can get back to you with, with more details on, on that. Councillor, perhaps I could redirect your question to the CAO. Recently, we discussed the, uh, the progress that Canada and the provinces are attempting to make in uh, a unified building code. Uh, Ms. Closer, do you want to uh, edify everybody on that? Uh, certainly, Mayor Burton. Uh, that was the conversation we had. Uh, they are looking at changes to the building code in order to bring some consistency across Canada, um, looking at the benefit of having that consistency so that um, contractors and consultants can deal with the same code across the country, supply chain could be improved, those types of things. Uh, I understand from um, Mr. Kaminsky, our uh, building uh, director, that uh, the building code is uh, updated on a regular basis. Um, they do have every five years a, a, a substantial update. Um, but I think, as uh, Rija has said, we will follow up with a memo specifically in terms of the actual Ontario building code. Uh, and when we will see either the changes of moving it into a national standard uh, or the regular updates, we'll send out a memo to council on the status of that. Thank you very much for that. While we're on, on efficiencies, on page 124 of the report, it talked about the integration of community energy strategy goals in the planning process. And it talks about, uh, let's call them the strategic growth areas in terms of uh, district energy or other opportunities. As we're receiving those planning requests now for development, just wondering how we tie that together or time frame uh, before the buildings get started. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, um, some of the working groups that I mentioned, such as the North Oakville Working Group, um, as well as the general uh, update process for the official plan review, um, those are opportunities for our team to work more closely with the planning division. Um, and they have brought forward opportunities for us. Um, we've, we've looked into, for example, district energy as a part of the Midtown um, planning development. Um, so we are furthering, working to further strengthen that working relationship with planning so that we can integrate those CES goals wherever possible. Um, thank you. Thank you. Councillor, uh, I'd like to contribute a little bit of information. We've already approved at least three developments, one subdivision, several towers, and another uh, I guess I'll call it mid-rise, where it is, they are on district energy, built by the builders and, um, and becoming part of the property. And uh, they're relying on geothermal, which is, uh, some would say, uh, perhaps the best. And so, in fact, there's a, there's a groundbreaking later this week I, I plan to be at for the latest one. So progress is occurring. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Councillor Robertson. Thank you for your report, Rija. It's, it was a great report and it's, it shows a lot of promise. I know that labor is always the key to this and you talked about the training sessions. Do you have, know how many contractors we currently have in Oakville that have the training to be able to do retrofits? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, we don't currently have uh, a solid sense of the, the what the contractor industry in Oakville looks like. Um, we have begun to look into it as a part of this initiative that we're pursuing, um, and, and that initiative does include doing that due diligence and research to, to look at the current market of contractors and develop a list to see you know, who can we invite to participate in these trading sessions um, and, and further engage as a part of the, the longer development towards the retrofit program. Okay, thank you. And I know we also talked originally that there is a great ability for this to morph into more business, that we could possibly have industries right within the town that would make retrofitting supplies. 
Um, do we look at that in terms of encouraging manufacturing or anything in the town for this? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, the business case report didn't look into that specifically, but it can certainly be looked at in more detail as a part of the next business planning phase. Great. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you, councillor. Councillor hazlitt Deal. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Thank you for your report. Um, you mentioned that things are going to evolve, and, and you laid out sort of uh, some general statements about what, what, what's going to need to happen over the next while. But could you give us an, a, the public a sense of timing in terms of when you would be back to us uh, with uh, further information around, uh, more detailed information around that business case, uh, the financing, uh, how, uh, you know, whether, whether there's an FCM grant that's going to support this. Can you give us a little more insight into that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, our proposed timeline uh, to complete the business plan phase is um, end of 2023, provided that, again, we secure the, the funding needed to complete the next phase, and that includes the FCM grant application. And at that time, we would hope to be in a good position to bring forward um, a potential program design that <clears throat> Council could approve for, for launch. Um, so this may be a bit of an unfair question, but it, and, and maybe the CA Hook wants to answer it. Um, so what would you need from Council to go faster? Um, that might be a good use of our tool of a request for a report, rather than asking people to answer off the top of their head. If, if it, I agree with you, it might be an unfair question. Um, at the same time, it is an important question to be answered. And it, so if I might... do have to ask it as a request for a report, I, I guess I could go through that procedural. But I, I do think we need to understand what what would uh, what would enable us to help you be able and FEO to move more quickly? Because you're you're laying a very solid foundation. You're doing tremendous uh, consultation. You're engaging the community. I think there's lots of positives here. I just want to be supportive uh, and understand. Um, so if it, if you could report back, CEO Posey, uh, on what it might take, um, that would be terrific. There's actually an opportunity in this agenda later for a request for a report, and it would be a welcome uh, suggestion at that time. I'm trying to encourage you. Thank you, Mayor Burton. All right, Councillor Elger. Thank you, through you, Mayor Burton. Um, thanks for the presentation. With, with regard to buses, uh, a lot of people are seeing empty diesel buses, and it, you know now we have electric coming. Do you have numbers of what is coming? I, I saw a percentage, 50%. And I see we're on track for the first email buses by the end of the year, which will be used for uh, caravan. How many buses are there that are coming to be used for caravan at first? And then you mentioned we're going to get regular, but conventional with 2023 and 2024. Uh, do you, uh, I'm just curious how many buses are coming in, in like next year for conventional? Also, do we have that data, or is that part of request for report to come from to council? Madam CAO, perhaps you could refresh everybody's memory on this. Uh, Mayor Burton, uh, to Councillor Elgar, we actually had prepared a memo um, to council on the um, uh, fairly recently. Uh, it may have even been on the last council agenda. Um, so what I will do is forward that along because I'm sorry, I can't remember the number of buses that were in there. You are correct by the end of the year uh, that the specialized buses will be here. And then I think in early 24, there is a number and it rolls out over a certain period of time. So we had provided that memo and I'll make sure I forward it along to all of council so you can see the timing of the electrification of our transit. And, and I appreciate that. I realize we can't send it out to any of our members of the public right now because we're in an election time, but... There's it didn't be a lot of people asking that question, so and I can't remember myself, but I know it, it, it is it looks not bad, but to maybe but though when you look at capital funding and, and how much it costs to get rid of actually get rid of the diesel buses, which cost a lot of money. Uh, but I think the public they, we're at a time that people are looking at that. So 
I think the sooner we can get that and if we get the election over and we send it out and tell the residents too, that'd be kind of nice. Thank you. Uh, I would Thank add you, that Elgin. all of our memos are actually on the council agenda package. So it is available to the public and we will look at the means on our website to try and provide more information on the electrification. So Thank that's you. something we'll follow up on. Well, good. Uh, she'll, they'll, they'll do it for us. Even better. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, that uh, brings us to the point where it'd be in order to call the uh, delegations. Would you please begin? Our first delegation is here in person in the chamber, uh, Richard Thomas and John Matheson. Welcome, Mr. Thomas and, and Mr. Matheson. Council is looking forward to your information. Thank you. I'm assuming here and not over there, but I guess either works. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, councillors, uh, members of the public. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on future energy Oakville. Uh, my name is John Matheson. In addition to being a 35-year resident of Oakville, I'm also the president and uh, board chair of Future Energy Oakville. With me today is Mr. Richard Thomas, who is our new executive director of Future Energy Oakville. I'm very excited that he is with us uh, in, an in the organization and with us here tonight. Um, oh, Brian, move this. <coughs> All right. For those watching online or with, he, with us here today at Town Hall who don't uh, know who Future Energy Oakville is, and as mentioned earlier by uh, town staff, we are a, uh, uh, a community-led, community-driven, not-for-profit organization whose primary purpose is to lead the community-wide implementation of the Oakville Community Energy Strategy. Uh, the CES is a data-driven plan that has been developed through a community-led task force, which has since become an advisory board or an advisory team to Future Energy Oakville. The uh, community energy strategy, as, as mentioned earlier by uh, Richard from the town, has three goals, which are aligned with the timelines of the town's planning process on the, the 01 years. So the goals of the CES are really to increase energy efficiency by at least 40%, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50%, and generate $7 billion in cumulative energy cost savings to the town. Um, as explained in the CES, the, the intent of, aligning the 24, uh, uh, aiming for the 2041 targets is that it sets a path to net zero by 2050, and that the bulk of the heavy lifting will have been done in the first couple of decades. Uh, FEO's purpose is really to set the processes and projects in place early so that the resultant impacts can be experienced both during that period and following. Today we're, we're here to give an update on uh, our agreements, uh, on the requirements provided to us in the service agreement. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to... Am I advancing? Got it. All right. I will just say next slide. Okay. First down. Got it. Thank you. Um, the, the service agreement with the town, as, as mentioned earlier, it, its objective is really to accelerate the Oakville Community Energy Plan. The initial term was for, is 14 months, and as mentioned, the contributions uh, from the town to the FEO have been 250000 which we're very thankful for uh, over the last uh, uh, three years, from 2020 to 2022. Uh, in addition to that, we have received incredible administrative support from, from Rija at the town. The following slide shows the, uh, the various imp uh, implementation objectives, uh, obligations that are right within the, uh, the service agreement itself. And I'm not going to read through each of them, but the remaining slides in my presentation will address uh, these topics by providing an update. On the next slide, it talks through the three governance obligations that we have uh, as Future Energy Oakville, the first being to onboard our executive director, completed, ensure applicable reporting is completed, which uh, we have an auditor, and we'll, we'll talk through some of those numbers later, and to report to town council by the end of the term, which is what we are doing here today. So where have we come from? The, the following slide talks about the journey to create the FEO, and I'm going to not read all of these points in detail as they were covered quite well by uh, Rija from the town. But you know, fundamentally, we launched, launched this process all the way back in 2017 
The Oakville Energy Task Force was created in 19. We created a strategy that was endorsed by town and FEO was incorporated as a result of, of the task force not wanting the plan just to sit on a shelf. We wanted action and results. So we uh, established Future Energy Oakville in early 2021. The following slide shows what we have done since then, which as I have to admit as I was putting the slide together, there's, there's a lot of things going on here. So following the incorporation of the board uh, with the three founding board members, myself and our, our treasurer and corporate secretary, we immediately began fundraising. Uh, we also worked with the town to establish a services agreement that we're here asking for an extension for. We then continued to expand the board and uh, I'll elaborate on that a little bit further. Uh, working with Sheridan College, we have a services agreement in place where they are providing a lot of financial support from an accounting, financial management, and uh, support selecting an auditor. Uh, we engaged some of our marketing activities by hiring a web designer uh, and began the process of launching our website. Uh, we continued to expand the board. We uh, on, identified and selected an auditor. Uh, we developed a branding guide. As part of FEO, uh, actually a very important part of FEO is community engagement. And through that, we wanted to make sure that we had a common, common view, a common look. Uh, and so we, we engaged branding consultants and developed our uh, marketing baseline. Uh, we then hired an external fundraising consultant. During COVID, it was particularly difficult raising funds for Future Energy Oakville, so we went to a professional firm, and we have uh, since brought them on board as well. We became a member of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, fantastic organization uh, that gave, gives us grassroots uh, connections into the community from both a, a networking and a sponsorship and a community engagement perspective. We onboarded our executive director, a key milestone in the growth and the step change growth that we're going to be seeing in the near term. And I'm pleased to announce just this week, actually, we have launched our website. So we are live on the web and around the world. Uh, and tonight we are uh, providing an update to council. So the following slide uh, shows our diverse board of directors that we have grown over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, you know, representatives from various industries uh, across the town, um, you know, all members of, of Oakville in one way or another, including uh, you know, uh, Councillor Longo here. It's been a fantastic support. We have uh, a legal representative. We have a youth representative. We have a regional representative, various technology firms. So a nice, diverse representation um, on the board. Uh, but we're not done. So the next slide talks about our uh, additional remaining seat. We, are, we do have a director vacancy, and some of the key skills that we are looking for in this position include connections to the philanthropic community, as well as uh, home builders. These are two skills that were light on our board at the moment. <coughs> and it's important to note that as we've grown our board, uh, we have done so using a, a very structured skills matrix to make sure that we are balanced in, in terms of diversity and in terms of, of knowledge to, to continue uh, moving forward. Uh, on the next slide, it just talks a little bit about our communications that we have done. One of our requirements was to respond to various public inquiries, which we have done over the past year and a half uh, on, on numerous occasions, and a few uh, communication updates that will be pending are, are some news releases about uh, our organization, our executive director, and really importantly at the end there, really should be at the beginning, is, is launching a proper community engagement uh, program. We have been very light in that, uh, partially because of COVID, partially because we have not had a full-time member of the organization, uh, but we do need to get out to service organizations, to residents associations, to uh, you know, uh, various uh, educational organizations and environmental organizations in the, in the town that are, that are committed and, and want to know more about what we're doing and how to help. Uh, and our, our next slide talks about our, our digital presence. Actually, we can go through this pretty quickly. That is a snapshot of our website, which, as I mentioned, has just been launched. The next slide, uh, we, one of the requirements was to provide a, a financial update. So uh, you know, we have a high-level income statement here and, and then a balance sheet following. Uh, the left column is our budget uh, versus our actuals, and, and you'll see the uh, lower-than-anticipated growth that we were expecting, partially due to COVID partially due to not having full-time uh, staff and partially because of uh, uh, challenges really during uh, sponsorship, uh, during the sponsorship period. So the revenues are lower, uh, expenses are lower as a result, but we, uh, uh, I guess we do have a surplus there that we're going to be leveraging in the near term. 
Uh, next slide shows at a you know, really high level, we do have uh, significant cash in the bank to keep uh, Richard going, and Richard will be aggressively growing that, as well as uh, reaching out for additional sponsorship to expand the team. I guess just last slide that I'll talk about before introducing Richard is, is how you know, the last few years have really all been about planning. Uh, we've developed a strategy, we launched FEO, spent some time recruiting the ED, and you know, the board members are all doing this off the sides of our desks. Uh, very pleased with some of the work that the town has done as, as far as uh, you know, advancing some studies uh, linked to some of the priority projects, and, and that's really helped get things going. Uh, we, they, we have come to us for some comments on some of these, uh, and you know, some of them we provided some, we received some updates on just recently, which is uh, very exciting. But now that we have the ED on board, this is, to us, this is that, that pivot point in the growth of, of what we've been doing. So we will be accelerating the community priority projects uh, facilitation and coordination, and really focusing on some of the high impact areas, such as transportation, such as buildings, uh, as was outlined in the actually in April um, staff report. So with that, I, I'm, gonna, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our FEO's recently appointed executive director. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Richard Thomas. Richard brings 40 years of experience in operations leadership, marketing, community engagement, issues management, and revenue development to this role. Uh, Richard and his family are also longtime residents of Oakville, and over the past several years, he's been actively involved in enriching our community through multiple volunteer roles within several youth sports organizations. He holds an undergraduate degree from UBC, as well as an MBA from Western. Uh, FEO board is very pleased to have Richard join the team, and we look forward to supporting him as he leads the FEO uh, his next steps. So I'd just like to ask for the next slide. Richard has one or two topics to mention. Good evening, Your Worship, uh, Council, and my fellow Oakville residents. It's my honor to appear here today and to be invited to lead FEO forward to a greener, more prosperous, and more energy efficient community in which to live, work, and invest. I accept the responsibilities placed in me with the utmost humility, and I commit to serving the community I love with the utmost professionalism, transparency, and fidelity. I look forward to appearing before this body on many occasions in the coming months and years to come to provide both timely status updates to you all, as well as to celebrate important milestones met. I thank you again for vesting your trust in me, and I look forward to my challenge ahead. Oh, may I see the next slide? Oh, this slide is right here. Great. I want to let you know a little bit about what uh, has been given to me as my, my immediate next steps, as well as my next steps for 2023. With regard to, regarding to the immediate next steps, which I define to be the final quarter of this current year, I intend to meet as many key stakeholders as I possibly can to listen, to get input, get direction, get advice. I value that enormously from all parties. Secondly, I wish to accelerate the funding that is required to give oxygen to FEO going forward, not just from this esteemed body, but from corporate partnerships in Oakville and perhaps outside of Oakville as well. Thirdly, I wish to engage the community on priority projects and the partners who will help us reach those priority projects in the timelines we're, met, we're setting out for ourselves. And finally, within this quarter, I hope to launch a community communications and engagement strategy that begins a long process of letting, again, Oakville residents and businesses know what we're all about, what we're trying to achieve together as a community and how they can get involved and how we can help them get involved to do that. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, these are just the first quarter of my mandate and they're a busy quarter, but I intend to continue the momentum I hope to achieve this quarter by setting out for 2023 the following priorities. Once again, accelerating the funding required to uh, advance FEO's objectives. Secondly, facilitate business planning and oversight for the four key foundational uh, initiatives that comprise our mandate, home and building energy retrofit project, the local energy supply and distribution project, the district energy project, and the transportation electrification initiative as well. And with that, at the appropriate strategic time, I plan to bring on board um, key members of the FEO team that will help me uh, manage and administer the objectives that we have set up before us. Uh, I return the floor to finish off. John. 
Thanks, and, and that actually concludes our, our presentation. Thank you very much for your time, Council, and, and if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you very much for a very heartening presentation. Uh, it seemed to me that you brought everything together into a, co into a quite a coherent and uh, feasible plan, and uh, uh, you made me a believer, so thank you very much for that. I'll turn to Council for questions. Council, are there any questions? Oh, Councillor Noel. Just a very quick, easy question. It's not skill testing. What is the URL of your new website? I could not find it in the report, and I can't find it on Google. Uh, th th through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, it's, it's uh, www.futureenergyoakville.ca. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. I wish all of our questions were so easily <laughs> yeah. answered. Thank you very much for the time and the care you took, uh, obviously, in preparing such a good presentation. We appreciated you uh, coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? The next delegation is also here in the council chamber. Uh, Hart Jensen, representing Halton Action for Climate Ener Emergency Now. Welcome, Mr. Jensen. Council looks forward to your comments. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council, for the opportunity to delegate. Here we are. And yes, I'm representing... Halton Action for Climate Emergency Now, or HASEN. Uh, next slide. Just say next slide. Okay. Uh, to set the context of our discussion, please remember that Canada is among the worst carbon emitters in the world and has about three times the emission, uh, emissions of the G20 average. Oakville likely has emissions even higher than that due to our larger residences more cars per household, and frequent air travel. Let's also be aware that we now have definitive proof that fossil fuel combustion causes lung cancer, as well as the increased heart attacks, strokes, and lung disease that we knew about before. So not only do we have a global responsibility to cut our carbon emissions, but also a responsibility to our own community to reduce local air pollution that causes lung cancer and other diseases. Next slide. To preface my further remarks, I do want to thank the members of the Oakville Energy Task Force who have spent thousands of hours of mostly volunteer time to develop the community energy strategy and create future energy Oakville. We all share the same goals of increased energy efficiency and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. That being said, we find ourselves in a more urgent and serious state of emergency than when it was declared three years ago. Yes, the town has made good progress on its corporate emission reduction goals, like electric electrification of our bus fleet, but these account for only one and a half percent of the emissions in Oakville. We need a strong focus on community projects, such as residential retrofits and EV infrastructure, where the larger benefits are to be found. On the community front, we're about two years behind original timelines. We have an emissions reduction goal 19 years in the future with no intermediate targets or stated metrics. Also, the town has not yet passed bylaws as other municipalities have to enable third party retrofit financing attached to the property. These are essential to encourage homeowners and the private sector to proceed with retrofit solutions. So for the voters who may be watching, as I only have 10 minutes, I can't present all the background for the complex issues involved. Please see my background notes and speaker's notes at the uh, URL on your screen. Next slide. So how far behind are we in community projects? This page out of the community energy strategy shows some initial milestone targets. So for 1.1, for example, the residential retrofits uh, project, again, as presented by staff in the FEO, we apparently will begin the business planning task in 2023, um, assuming more grant funding is secured. And the initial target for completion was 2020. For 1.2, incorporating a company to do the retrofits, this would presumably happen after the business plan is approved, again, as we were told, likely in late 2023 or 2024. So we're a couple of years behind there at, at a minimum. So yes, COVID slowed everything down, 
but other features of the plan, such as the hope for uh, FEO funding from the private sector, also did not pan out as hoped. In any case, the climate crisis did not take a break. So we should be contemplating how we can make up lost ground. Next slide. We need to reevaluate our emission reduction targets given scientific and political developments over the last three years. New, more appropriate goals have recently been set by both the Canadian and US governments, among others. So the Canadian federal government has a, a, a emissions reduction target of 40 to 45% by 2030. The US uh, has a 52% <coughs> reduction target by 2030. So I would suggest that Oakville needs a new uh, needs an intermediate target for 2030, given the recent IPCC reports and new federal targets. Also, the Climate Action Directions Report received by Council in April from town staff itself states that mitigation is critical if we want to avoid more catastrophic climate impacts. In Oakville, effort needs to focus on our highest sources of greenhouse gases, namely buildings and transportation. Next slide. So this projection from the Community Energy Strategy shows reductions in emissions starting in 2020 and 2021. Although the most recent data for Halton shows emissions rising as per the dotted line at the top of the screen. So nominally, we're about 100,000 tons behind in our emissions reduction target at the start of 2023. To my knowledge, no emission reductions have been achieved to date, other than the corporate reductions, again, which only affect 1.5% of emissions. For residential emissions, uh, again, existing and new homes in the blue box on the left-hand side of the screen, um, uh, are shown, the, the emission reductions are shown to start in 2021. What is the cause of these supposed reductions? No retrofits have happened and new inefficient housing stock is being added continually. Some public interaction with the task force, the Oakville Energy Task Force and the FEO would be extremely helpful here to first alert the public of the problem so that they can be part of the solution. We urgently need a public reporting framework with metrics and reporting periods to get the public on board. <coughs> Next slide. The key takeaway from the feasibility study is that the recommended set of retrofits would not achieve the stated goal of 50% emissions reduction by 2041. It's showing 38% reduction. This seems to be because they are recommending installation of new gas furnaces as part of some retrofits. Gas furnaces are the primary residential source of greenhouse gas emissions. So the average recently built 2,500 square foot house emits about four to five tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. I live in a nine-year-old house with a heat pump that emits less than half a ton of carbon per year. That's a 90% reduction from the average house. We have to do everything we can to get off gas. Next slide, please. So Guelph and other municipalities have passed bylaws to enable third-party financing of energy retrofits. Should Oakville urgently do the same? We hope that a collection of municipalities could also lobby the provincial government on their climate policies, as they have in other important policy areas. Uh, and just to, to repeat, the most shocking result of the feasibility study and its recommendations is to install new gas furnaces. When does focus on the profit motive for the retrofit entity overwhelm the entire emissions reduction initiative. Can each of you on council condone this perpetuation of fossil fuels far into the future? Vancouver and Montreal, as well as the UK and other European countries, have completely banned new gas furnaces as of 2025. I would suggest that's the right direction. So we recommend, Hasten recommends, uh, that we immediately update and revamp the feasibility study to remove the new gas furnace element before business planning proceeds. 
And finally, to meet more ambitious goals, uh, ambitious climate goals, we need more staff, both at the town and at the FEO. We've spent about $100 million on community centers in the last few years. Let's thoughtfully spend a few million dollars on our collective future. This spending would result in additional local jobs and energy cost savings for residents, as well as reduced emissions. Understand that prompt climate action also benefits the health of the entire community. That means everyone in this room, everyone in Oakville, their children and their grandchildren. Uh, last slide, please. So what else do we need to move forward? We need to pivot from business as usual, uh, which I think we've, we've been reported on business as usual, to emergency mode. So we've, we've seen that for the retrofit study, the feasibility study, we apply for a grant, you wait for five, six months, the money comes in, you take a year to do the study, and we're about to do that all over again for our business planning. And then we can think about, well, what pilot projects are we gonna start with? What are we gonna, how do we get started? That's business as usual. Um, this isn't emergency action. We need creative and thoughtful shortcuts while also building a longer term plan. And council, please, when discussing climate initiatives, make a distinct separation between corporate and community projects. Uh, because the community projects is where the gains are to be made. I mean, yes, of course, you're responsible for the corporation, but you have a highly important duty to the citizens at large. And to engage the public in this endeavor, we need a timeline with intermediate targets. We need metrics, regularly published information, not to mention opportunities for genuine public interaction. Emergency mode means we need to be bold, entrepreneurial, and quick-footed. We are depending on council to lead in this matter, at least until we have an effective mechanism in the FEO and the private sector. As our community leaders, you have the resources and you have the authority. Please take responsible and urgent action in this state of climate emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, for your uh, 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 ministrations to us tonight. Council, do you have questions for Mr. Jensen? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? Our next delegation is Andrea Rowe from Halton Environmental Network, uh, joining us on Zoom. There'll be the customary Zoom pause while that happens somehow. Very good. There, have I officially joined? Welcome, Ms. Rowe. We can hear you and see you, and we're delighted to see you and hear you. Please begin. Wonderful. Thank you, Your Worship, Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to delegate this evening. Um, my name is Andrea Rowe. I'm Interim Executive Director for Halton Environmental Network. And uh, you will have received a written submission from our Board of Directors Acting Chair, Cindy Toth. I'm here this evening to reaffirm our support to Future Energy Oakville and the work that they are doing and will do in the future to advance climate action in the community. Hen volunteers on the Community Energy Task Force. Hen has been on the board since its inception. We remain committed to the process and the work. Oakville's community energy strategy directly supports Council's climate emergency declaration to significantly lower community greenhouse gas emissions. We acknowledge that it's been challenging during the pandemic, but that planning and other work has not stopped. And we're excited about the next steps and look forward to furthering this agenda. By continuing to work together, we will support and advance climate action in the community of Oakville and Halton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you very much for Hen's uh, continued confidence in FEO and the community energy strategy. Council, are there any questions for Hen? Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? 
Our next delegation is also coming to us through Zoom, Michelle McCollum, the co-chair of the Oakville Energy Task Force. Welcome, Ms. McCollum. Council looks forward to your information. Very good evening, uh, Mayor Burton and members of Council. It's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening as a proud member of the Oakville community to delegate on uh, behalf of the Oakville Energy Task Force in my role as co-chair. Um, my friend and fellow co-chair, Harry she unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, but he does send his regrets and his best regards to you all. Um, the strategy we developed and the path that we were on we are on is about a full transformation for the community that is going to result in environmental, social and economic benefits. We recognise that you know taking on this big challenge does need us to think differently and it needs us all to work together, industry, government, institutions and the community and it needs continued support as we go down this path. Our work together is of fundamental importance in creating an Oakville that is resilient, a model for community for uh, sustainability in Canada, where we, um, you know, we've worked together to reduce energy costs and GHG emissions while strengthening the local community and building an affordable and resilient energy future. And our innovative vehicle, and it's so nice to see John and Richard presenting. Uh, delighted to have Richard on board now. Um, Future Energy Oakville uh, will continue to work to ensure that our energy strategy is actionable and achievable. This work is not easy. It takes time and it needs support and dedication. I wanted to acknowledge um, that, you know, the work we do and the different voices we hear, the different perspectives are really important. And I thank uh, Hart and Hasten and also Hen for the thoughtful delegations this evening. And, um, you know, while we can have different views about the path to get there, um, I do agree with Hart that we're aligned in our, in our ultimate goals. I think the important thing to note is that we need to move forward. This plan has taken a lot of work. Uh, we've worked so hard and we want to continue to look for uh, the implementable opportunities to accelerate the progress that we've been making. I would also argue that the use of natural gas in the model, which reduces consumption, supports clean energy, is still a viable and essential component of the plan and in having an, a resilient energy plan for our community and for uh, the province. I really commend this council. You know, you, you have the courage to have the tough and important conversations on putting resource, resources and actions where they're most needed. Um, I really commend you on your continued leadership and for taking serious action around climate change, including declaring the climate emergency back in 2019. Um, I sincerely thank you and town staff for your continued support to the Energy uh, Task Force and to Future Energy Oakville. And a special shout out and thank you to Councillor Longo. Um, you have been a long and uh, very passionate uh, supporter and you know you do personal work uh, for uh, well, you know, being on the FEO board and thank you for that. Um, and to uh, Rija and Swaraj uh, for your work. So I, I would like to uh, voice uh, the Oakville Energy Task Force uh, for the support uh, for the recommendations that are before you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. It's lovely to see everyone. Thank you very much, Ms. McCollum, for your kind remarks and your good advice. Madam Clerk, uh, would you call the next delegation? The next uh, uh, and last registered delegation is Mervyn Russell joining us here in the chamber. Mr. Russell, welcome. Council looks forward to your exhortations and information. So, Your Worship, the Mayor and, and Councillors, before I actually start on this uh, presentation of my delegation, I just want to say, in what I'm going to call these rather solemn uh, times, uh, the uh, honour and uh, gratitude I feel at being able to stand and speak here in this uh, place, uh, in which uh, it is uh, governed uh, by the kind of democratic 
uh, constitution and laws uh, that we have. And uh, we should never take these things for granted, and I hope that they will always endure. So I want to thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you uh, today regarding the report of the Strategy, Policy, and Communications Department, SPCD, and in particular to the issues related to the Oakville Energy Task Force, OETF, and the future of Energy Oakville Corporation, FEO, organizations that have already dedicated this evening. I want to begin by referring to the Project Working Team's Community Energy Plan that was presented to Council on February the 12th, 2020 by SPCD. In paragraph four of key facts on page two, it states, and I quote, the Implementation Management Office, which later became FEO, will be governed by the Oakville Energy Task Force and a board of directors. However, according to the OEF website, the OEF, uh, OETF, I get uh, these uh, muddled up in my speech, did not meet between September 29th, 2020 and last Tuesday. This was the very period in which the newly incorporated FEO was struggling to find directors, get financial supporters, compose their bylaws, and establish a website. What governance help was the OETF giving FEO during this time? This seemingly absence of action hardly shows concern about ensuring that FEO would reduce Oakville's energy consumption and carbon emissions as rapidly as possible. I and others at that time were urging the members of OETF to become active in helping FEO to establish itself, but we received no replies. Similar, SPCD report under the item, Town of Oakville support for the IMO recommended that the Town of Oakville should, and I quote, continue to broker partnership opportunities for the delivery of priority projects and work with Sheridan College and other task force members to write and submit grant applications. Insofar that FEO was struggling to get results in both these areas, I cannot help wondering to what extent these recommendations were forthcoming. It has seemed to me and to others that once FEO was incorporated with three foundational directors but no executive director, it was basically left to get on with it. And this go-it-alone situation has considerably held up its progress, which was quite the opposite of what was needed in responding to a climate emergency. Now, I may be completely wrong about what I am supposing. If I am, I hope I will be forgiven, because in fact, getting worthwhile information about what was happening as regards the development of the FEO during this period was practically impossible. The OETF, as I've mentioned, did not reply, provide any replies, nor did the two public at large representatives, nor even the councillor appointed to OETF. The situation was not improved by the fact that the FEO did not have an active website until last Friday. For a community-based organization, supported by public funds and seeking community support, the communication of FEO's needs, development, and support has been, to say the least, very disappointing. I hope that now that an executive director has finally been appointed, the number of directors filled out, an active website is existing, and a strategy is now in place to move forward with priority project number one, the housing retrofit program, I hope that gaining the financial support of businesses, government, and individuals, along with community communication, will considerably improve. Finally, I'd like to make a few comments about the retrofit project as it was presented to the OETF on Tuesday, September 13th. 
I appreciate the considerable research, thought, and composition that's gone into the Garforth International Retrofit Strategy proposal. There's a great deal of information in that, which will be very important and helpful in moving the project forward. However, a word you're probably expecting, I'm disappointed that the strategy provides for the installation of carbon-fueled air conditioners and furnaces. Nationally, globally, it is imperative that carbon fuels become obsolete as quickly as possible. I'm disappointed that the strategy only reaches 40% carbon emissions reductions by 2041, rather than the 50% of the community energy plan. I would rather it had been 40% by 31. The project is foundational to reducing Oakville's carbon emissions. It needs to be returned, like the planning strategy in this, this region, it needs to be returned to the drawing board to improve on what it promises. I want current installers of retrofit equipment to have input into the organization of the proposed contracting retrofit company so that their experience is heard and heeded. I would like the bylaws that are needed to the council to apply the provincial local improvement charges to be passed and publicized as soon as possible so that the public can begin making these improvements using existing installers and thereby providing the company founded by the town with some competition in our good free market understanding of how the economics should be run. Lastly, I remind Council of the words of the CPE under the Task Force 2041 goals. Quote, the CPE should be updated regularly to respond to changes in climate knowledge, energy policy, and global best practices. End of quote. 2020 CPE should be reviewed for needed revisions. Last. We seem to be making some progress on the community energy plan. I close by urging the Oakville Energy Task Force and the Council of the Town of Oakville to show constant interest, support, and publicity for the FEO. At the same time, I would urge the FEO to be open to environmental activists and seek to be in partnership with us. We are not scary people. We are just middle-class people. We play in bands, we sing in choirs, we pay our taxes, tend our gardens, try to get on with our neighbors, and dote on our grandchildren. But who at the same time are passionate about preserving the wonder of our planet and maintaining the vitality variety of its nature for future generations. We are one of the best sources of credible, good publicity that you can get. Thank you, Your Thank you very much for the uh, care with which you gave us your exhortations. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, man. Madam Clerk, you said that was the last delegation? All right. Um, Council, I have a couple of questions for staff before we make a decision here. And I should point out, this is a, it's not a weighty decision. We're receiving the update and, uh, and we're authorizing a, a small extension of the financial support uh, so that the, the very work and reports that are being asked for can be done. Um, uh, staff, does anybody want to uh, help the public understand this reference to gas furnaces in the, uh, in the study just released? I ask because I recently called a contractor, a large one, to um, discuss installing a heat pump in my home. And the kind gentleman pointed out to me that the most efficient and, and uh, economical way for me to achieve my wish was to keep my existing gas furnace, hook it up to this system, and, uh, and it would only run 
on the very coldest days of the year when the heat pump uh, would not be adequate unless I wanted to buy a much more expensive heat pump. And, uh, and so I had the impression that, uh, you know, it might be possible to kind of have it both ways, have a heat pump and have a little backup and not, and, you know, and be able to actually get to a heat pump a little sooner. I mean, if, it's, if I had to buy the one twice as expensive, it would take me longer to save that up. Anyway, what is in this study that is so uh, alarmed some people about uh, not banning gas furnaces and so on? Thank you for your question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the business case report um, in its model and analysis um, looked at offering residents two standardized retrofit packages as retrofit options for their home. And one of those packages uh, looked exclusively at, at heat pumps as the retrofit option. And the other package looked at um, replacing your current air conditioner furnace um, equipment with a like but more efficient gas version. Um, and part of the, the reason for that inclusion was we know that not 100% of, of residents who are interested in participating in a retrofit program will opt for the heat pump option. It is about $2,500 to $3,000 more expensive. Um, so in order to kind of provide an alternative that's still more energy efficient than what you currently have and that is a bit more affordable um, in an attempt to include more or, or br the broader public in participating in the program, that was an option that was, that was modeled for the purposes of the business case. That being said, um, this is not, at this stage, we're not advocating for or even excluding any technology. And this is not to say that what we do offer in a program will look exactly like what's modeled in the business case. The next phase of business plan development is really where we need to complete that due diligence and explore what a full program could look like. Um, and I also want to note that as technology continues to evolve, um, the offering in that retrofit package will continue to evolve as well. And my other question is, can, can council and I expect that in our next update, perhaps in the spring, the comments that uh, we've received tonight will be considered and, uh, and uh, inform the, the future report? Yes, um, we, as a part of the business case study, did have community engagement opportunity in that study. Um, and we will have further opportunities to engage community members as well as um, include um, consideration of comments that we heard today in that business plan development process. Um, the end of the business case is, is by no means an end to opportunities to, to take on more community engagement. There will be lots of continued opportunity for us to do that. Thank you very much for that. Council, do you have any questions? Would, uh, would someone like to uh, move the indicated motion that the strategy implementation update be received and the service agreement um, uh, uh, increase in funding of $50,000 be endorsed? Councillor Adams, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Madam CAO. Uh, Mayor Burton, I did want to take this opportunity, if I could, to address Councillor Elgar's earlier question about our electrification of our uh, transit fleet. Uh, so by the end of the year, we'll have 15 specialized uh, buses um, in as part of our fleet. We right now have 23, so it's a substantial portion of our specialized buses, which will be um, electrical. Uh, and then by the end of uh, 23, early part of uh, 24, uh, there should be another 15 conventional buses that will be um, in, uh, in our fleet. Uh, again, there's 106 of our um, conventional buses. We do estimate at this point in time of having the entire fleet electrified by 2035. However, there are some opportunities, I no doubt, coming up in the future for additional funding, which may enable us to bring that um, uh, date down or more earlier than the 2035. So if that helps with those numbers you were looking for. Council, I, I, uh, I can't resist the opportunity to share with you a little further information about uh, 
you know, the funding for electrifying our transit fleet. I well remember the, the, uh, the big announcement of the federal and provincial funding that was going to assist us and, and gave us these numbers. And a week later, they announced enough funding to convert Brampton's entire fleet of 300 buses. So uh, I invite you to consider that we may perhaps be givers and not takers here in Oakville. So, uh, but we're, we're soldiering ahead anyway. Um, so thank you uh, for that information. Uh, any objection to Councillor Adams' motion? Madam Clerk, there's none, and that carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. You. Although he declared the conflict on the matter uh, at the start of the meeting properly, the clerk is anxious that we note that Councillor Longo's declaration means that he did not vote on this. Uh... So there's uh, built and suspenders for you, Council. Um, Council, we now come to a delightful topic, and that's the Downtown Cultural Hub Work Plan update. And we have um, uh, no presentation, but um, uh, Commissioner Garvey is available if you have questions. Otherwise, the indicated motion is to uh, direct staff to proceed with capital planning based on a dispersed model of new cultural facilities, as we've discussed many times over the years, and that staff be directed to include appropriate capital budget request for council consideration in the budget process for next year. Is there a mover for that? Councillor Hazlitt Deal? I'm going to lower my hand and let Councillor Gibbons raise his hand first. Thank you very much. I can appreciate how. Uh, councillors representing the downtown could be eager to be the ones to put their name on it. Councillor Giddings, are you moving it? I'd be happy to if I could just briefly say that uh, we're so pleased that this is before us tonight. We've seen the difference made in the downtown area as a result of the extensive rebuilding and the, uh, the excitement and the vibrance that's there. Um, this is the next step. It's been talked about for quite a while and it will further support the arts community the retailers the shopkeepers and the residents so very exciting as are we all councillor everybody in town regards the downtown oakville as uh the go-to place and uh we learned that many years ago during the 150th anniversary celebrations when uh we mistakenly believed at the time that everybody identified with the different little ward that they lived in. And uh, so we designed 150th anniversary celebrations in each ward. And the members of the, the residents of those wards had a violent reaction. Why are you trying to keep me out of the main celebration in the downtown was the reaction. And we immediately reconfigured our approach and realized that uh, Downtown Oakville really is the symbol of Oakville, and it's one of the things that attracts people here. So um, um, it's moved by Councillor Giddings. Uh, we're in Committee of the Hall. We don't need a second. Uh, is there any objection to this motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection, and it is joyously carried. Council, if we turn now to item 9.3, we have the 2022 Oakville Municipal Development Corporation, AGM, appointment of auditors, directors, and approval of financial statements. Staff are available if you have questions. Otherwise, the indicated motion is in order that the resolution submitted by the board chair um, uh, be approved, that the appointment of auditors uh, be approved, that the uh, compensation for the directors be approved, and that the financial statements uh, be approved, and that the mayor as shareholder representative be authorized to sign the resolution for and on behalf of the town in its capacity as the sole shareholder. Councillor Adams? I've reviewed it and I'm uh, moving it. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, that is carried as well. Um, now, Council, at 9.4, we, uh, we have no presentation and the motion is that the report dated September 13th entitled Oakville Transit Energy Infrastructure and Energy Service Project Update be deferred. May I have a mover for that? Councillor Elgar, thank you very much. Any objection? That's carried and the item is deferred. Council, we have no confidential discussion items. There are no advisory committee minutes. 
And uh, it's now in order to rise and report to Council. And Councillor Longo, thank you for the motion. Any objection? Councillor Palmer? Uh, Sorry, uh, Mayor Alberta and uh, Councillor Sandu and I had a uh, motion to bring forward. Yes, and, and we're going to, we'll come to oh, that sorry. in a moment yeah. when we get to new business. It's late, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so I, I see Councillor Duddick uh, is also uh, standing back. So uh, I see no objection to the motion to rise and report, and I declare it carried. I rise and report that the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent items 7.1 to 7.9 and 7.10, and discussion items 9.1 to 9.4 as noted by the clerk. A mover and seconder for this report would be in order. Councillor Lischina, Councillor Grant, thank you very much. Is there any objection to the report? There being none, the report is adopted. You've had your information items circulated electronically. Uh, are there any questions about those? Councillor Hazlitt-Thiel. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, I have a question on 13.6. I, I appreciate the memo on mid-rise and tall buildings, and I'm just wondering if, um, I'm not sure if Director Charles is here, but maybe the commissioner could, just in terms of the, the total number of units, um, if all of those are approved, what would the status of the town be against the 2031 growth target um, and the 2041 growth target? Would you know that? For you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I would have to do the math for you, but I'm happy to do that and report back. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think it's important we know how we're tracking against those targets, so I appreciate the time. Thank you, Councillor. Um, you also have your status of outstanding issues report. Any questions? Then we come to new business. Now, Council, Councillor Palmer and Councillor Sandju, and many of the rest of us, are concerned by the recommendations of the redistricting commission, uh, who are proposing redrawn federal ridings, which will in turn uh, presumably change the provincial riding boundaries as well. And, um, and Councillor Palmer and Councillor Sandju have uh, crafted a motion that I think speaks very well to it. It's been distributed to you. And the deadline for offering comment to the redistricting commission is September 28th. And therefore, if we wish to uh, uh, support the, the concerns that I've heard from you and outlined in this, in this resolution by councillors Palmer and Sandhu, we need to waive the, pre the procedure bylaw in order to consider the matter tonight. And, um, and then, uh, a, a fully amended version has been circulated to you by the councillors, so we may not have a procedural complication about moving an amendment and so on, uh, if, you'll, if you'll follow my lead on this. So Councillor Elgar has moved that we waive the procedure bylaw to allow this. We're looking for a second for that. Councillor um, Robertson, did, did I see your hand? Thank you. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there's no objection, and so the procedure bylaw is waived with uh, an ample uh, excess of votes required. And so we now give the floor to Councillor Palmer and Councillor Sandhu. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for your comments. And uh, as it stands now, the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for Ontario wants to separate Oakville into three electoral districts. One is comprised entirely of Oakville residents. One is Oakville and Burlington residents. And the third has Oakville residents pairing with Milton and beyond. Residents in the last scenario, which is north of Dundas, all of the, uh, all of the residents that Councillor Sandu and I represent in Ward 7 and some Ward 6 residents would not have access to their MP within close geographical range. And given the kind of development occurring in Milton and the differences that exist in Georgetown, there is a marked difference in what residents will see as priorities. Thus, representation may suffer. 
by keeping Oakville's electoral divisions within the municipal boundaries of Oakville and allowing the higher growth northern areas to be aligned with lesser density areas to the south, it ensures an even balance and the ability to accommodate growth. Thank you, Councillor Palmer. Councillor Sandhu. Thank you, Mayor Burton, for the opportunity to speak on this. Um, this is uh, an issue I think that we've seen kind of across the board in every municipality where there's a larger growth community versus a, a less uh, uh, busting at the seams community. Um, I, I don't think that Oakville is different in that sense. I think what we need to send as a message to our federal counterparts is that Oakville is for all of us and that there should be no difference between north and south, east, west, or anything. Oakville is Oakville and our representation should be for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanju. Council, uh, in addition to these very fine reasons, it's true that I believe in Milton, they also, uh, th their population qualifies them to have a single district and, uh, and they're not getting one either. And, uh, and they are uh, reluctant about the proposal from the commission just as we are. And so if we pass this, we will be aligning ourselves strategically with our neighbor in Halton, our, our neighbor and partner in Halton, may I say. So um, I would suggest that um, it would be appropriate to um, read the motion if, um, if the clerk would be so kind or, or, and or uh, put it on the, uh, you know, the, the overhead camera and read it. And if you're uncomfortable to read it, I'll read it, if you can get it up. So while, while we're getting it up on the overhead, I can start reading. All right, please, okay. thank you. Well, actually, no, for the convenience of the public, we should do it all at once, I think. Okay, there it is. Here we go. All right. Away you go, thank you very much. So whereas the Canadian Constitution requires that federal districts be reviewed every 10 years to accommodate changes in population, whereas the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for Ontario has put forward a new electoral map proposing redistribution of electoral boundaries, Whereas the Electoral Boundaries Act provides that the Commission shall be governed by certain rules, including average population numbers, communities of identity and interest, historical patterns of an electoral district, and geographic size of electoral districts. Whereas the population quota for electoral districts is based on 116,500 people, Whereas the proposed redistribution recommends three electoral districts to include Oakville residents. Whereas the proposed electoral district named Georgetown Milton East will consist of the part of the town of Oakville lying northwesterly of Dundas Street West, Dundas Street East, and northeasterly of Regional Road 25. Whereas Oakville's current population within its municipal boundaries is approximately 225,000 and growing. Whereas a more efficient electoral grouping of elect Oakville's population might reflect an Oakville East and Oakville West, which would allow for a blending of population growth rates in a north-south manner. And whereas the public consultation began August 19th, 2022, and ends on October 29th, 2022. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Commission be made aware that Oakville Town Council opposes the proposed electoral district boundary changes as they do not reflect Oakville's communities of interest or identity or interest that the proposed changes do not reflect North Oakville's estimated population growth until 2031, that the proposed changes would put Oakville's newest area at a disadvantage for funding and support by being separated from the rest of Oakville, that the proposed changes would alienate the population in North Oakville from the rest of the town, causing an unnecessary divide and inhibiting Oakville's livability, that the proposed changes would result in Oakville's Ward 7 and Ward 6 residents being placed in a federal riding called Georgetown, Milton East, making it increasingly difficult to meet with their MP and to have community concerns addressed. 
that the population allocation and naming of any new electoral districts be reevaluated to better reflect the primary population of the electoral district, that Oakville residents are encouraged to make their voices heard and take part in the public hearing or write a submission to the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for Ontario and that Mayor Burton write to the Commission and request that they reevaluate the proposed electoral boundary changes to better reflect Oakville's community of interest. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Councillor Sandju. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burton. I just have one small amendment. Instead of the word alienate, could we please change that to separate? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, let's let's do that without. I don't think we need process for that, uh, unless you unless you uh, if you agree. So, Madam Clerk, I, I just, agree. I, and I defer to you. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll just change that to separate, which is a synonym for alienate, but uh, okay. perhaps a a nicer one. <laughs> So um, uh, if I could have the uh, council meeting again instead of the uh, screen there, thank you very much. Um, council, I I'd like to ask you to, uh, to have this a recorded vote and um, I'll still say, uh, is there any objection? And if there's no objection, the clerk will record our names uh, in the fashion of a recorded vote. Does that meet with your approval? Okay, everybody's good with that. I'm going to call the vote then with your permission. Is there any objection to this motion? Madam Clerk, there is no objection. Council has uh, supported this motion unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Um, we now come to regional reports and question period regarding town boards and advisory committees. And uh, I'm Councillor Knoll and Councillor Duddock. Thank you, Worship. Um, I have two matters of business I want to bring before Council on in this agenda item tonight. One is a happy one and one is a tremendously sad one. So I'll start with the happy first. Uh, I want to uh, say thank you to uh, everybody in the town of Oakville who supported the 25th Annual Oak Park Fall Fair. Uh, we had over 4,000 people in attendance this year. We raised more than $60,000 on behalf of the Oak Park Neighborhood Centre, which provides a whole range of services to uh, residents of uh, the town of Oakville. In fact, their ex services have expanded to include Burlington and Milton in some of their uh, energy support program uh, um, initiatives. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to everybody that was involved. The, the, my co-host, Doak Park Neighborhood Centre, my wife, of course, Michelle, uh, who is executive director there and the head cheerleader. Uh, the volunteers, our sponsors, vendors, and of course, town staff who did a yeoman's job in, in making sure that the, everything worked tickety-boo. Also, big thank you to uh, uh, His Worship, uh, Jazz, uh, Pav and of course uh, my uh, uh, Ward 5 uh, colleague and pal Mark for their support and attendance at the event. Uh, we truly had a great day so thank you everybody involved and uh, we look forward to the 26th annual event next year. On a sad note, um, putting my, uh, my responsibilities as the chair of the Halton Regional Police Board hat on for a moment, I just want to acknowledge uh, the very sad news uh, that is probably you know, familiar to all of you uh, but tomorrow will be the, the uh, funeral of Constable Andrew Hong, Hong, 48, who is the Toronto police officer killed in Peel uh, during that senseless uh, murderous uh, spree on September 12th. And uh, uh, Constable Andrew Hong was a hero um, and a tremendous uh, police officer, a family man, uh, a son, and a friend to many. And uh, he is going to be missed to all of his colleagues and to his community. Um, he is a servant to our our region, to our country, to the world in bringing peace and uh, uh, community safety. And his name certainly deserves to be recognized in our minutes as well as the minutes of other uh, legislative boards. I can't also say, go without uh, also recognizing a, a, uh, another officer that was killed on the 14th, which became a little less known because of the high profile uh, situation of uh, Constable Hongs, but Constable Travis Gillespie, uh, who was 38 and he was a young officer with the York Region Police Service, was killed at a hit, with a hit-on a drunk driving incident uh, on that date. Uh, another senseless killing of a person who put his self um, uh, or his community above self. Uh, he deserves our recognition and our thanks uh, to our community, to our country, and, and to the planet. So rest in peace, Constable Travis Gillespie, and rest in peace, Constable Andrew Hong. Thank you very much, Councillor Knoll.
Councillor Duddick, it's your turn. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't know if it's a regional, it's more a municipal town, but uh, I have the extreme pleasure of announcing that this year we will be in person doing the Oakville Santa Claus Parade. And we look forward to welcoming all the young families and, uh, and some of us more mature people, I might add, on November 19th. The same route applies downtown Oakville up Kerr Street. Um, I have uh, several colleagues who are serving on the committee with me, Councillor Robertson, Councillor Luschina, uh, Councillor Chisholm, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel help out the day of. Um, so we're very, very actively involved. Uh, the one good thing that did come out of our patients waiting to have an in-person parade was that the town provided a phenomenal lighting display in Coronation Park, which also included a very successful toy drive for our Oakville firefighters. And I've been advised by the commissioner uh, responsible for that portfolio that we're going to have a two four. We're going to have the drive through and we're going to have the Santa Claus parade. So something positive coming out of a negative. We look forward to seeing you all on the 19th. Thank you very much, um, Councillor, I mean, Chief Elf, Councillor Duck. And, and congratulations to all the other Santa Elves on Council. Um, I guess I have a, a bit of a happy note. Uh, it's my pleasure to wish my father a happy 99th birthday. Oh, wow. So. wow. <laughs> Thank you. So he's, he's matched his father. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. As you can imagine, that's a, a source of some hope for me. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We now turn to requests for report. Uh, Councillor Hazlitt-Thiel, may I make you an offer about the request for report that we discussed earlier? I actually had a um, uh, condolence. Oh, I beg your pardon. Well, please go ahead. I'm, I'm very sorry for assuming that we were done with that. Um, I think that it would be, a, um, and I'd ask my council colleagues, appropriate for us, us to have a minute of silence uh, for the Queen and to send our best wishes um, to King Charles and his family. I know the town has done uh, the condolences and all of us through our contacts with our residents have uh, shared our um, best wishes for um, uh, King Charles, but uh, I think a 70 year plus legacy is cause for pause. Um, may we all be such great public servants. Thank you very much, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. A moment of silence for the Queen. Thank you, everybody. Shall we move now to requests for reports? Sure. Councillor has a deal. May I make you an offer on the request that we discussed earlier? Sure. Um, I would like to um, uh, have the Office of Mayor and Council and town staff who are appropriately engaged in this area uh, work with you to, to craft a uh, well thought out request for report that will truly achieve uh, your objectives and inform council and the public and uh, we would bring that to the next council meeting if you would agree Thank you very much Mayor Burton. I'll take you up on that offer Thank you 
Then, Council, it would be in order for consideration and reading of the uh, bylaws as listed in the agenda, and we'll need a mover and a seconder. Councillor O'Meara and Councillor Sandju, thank you very much. Any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, the bylaws are considered in red. And uh, Council and public, that ends the business of this meeting. It has been terrific working with you. And I truly appreciate the way everybody brought their best self to the, to the game. And uh, I think we did a lot of good work for the town. Until the next time, the meeting is done. <laughs>